the meat of this discussion today, which um, will explore the need um, for a framework to address those new sort of challenges um, that are um, that are the outcome of um, the cross-border nature of the internet and ge geographical um, um, scope of national jurisdictions. Um, I would like to draw your attention on one specific um, set of new challenges, which is um, the rise of direct cross-border requests. Today, we struggle, um, or the international system, the traditional mode of interstate legal cooperation, struggles um, um, to cope with this highly interconnected environment, which is cyberspace. So in, an increasing number of states are sending direct requests to platforms or technical operators physically located in other jurisdictions. Um, we all know how this looks like if we have a look at the transparency report of companies, um, where we see the, the rising number of, of, of states that are listed basically as senders of requests. And today there's no real framework to handle those um, requests. There's no real policy standard. So the Internet and Jurisdiction Project as a global dialogue process between the different stakeholders over the past two and a half years developed um, together in this multi-stakeholder um, framework. Um, does this work? Um, a draft framework. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, a draft architecture for such a transnational due process framework, which you also find in this, exactly, in this report on page 18. Um, so as you will see, and I will not go into the details, and we will have time to discuss this later during the session, it is based on two pillars. One pillar is of how to send requests um, from one country to operators located in another country through a standardized request format and the creation of two um, joint databases that are commonly available to all actors. One would collect transparency statistics in a standardized way, and the other one would contain all the different legal um, references and also the um, corresponding national procedures if certain laws are invoked. This relates um, to the discussion we just had in the presentation of the outcome of um, the working group number three. And um, the second pillar of this framework, as you can see here, um, relates to um, the development, the joint development in a multi-stakeholder format of um, process predictability um, consisting of procedural norms and criteria, um, the development of advice groups that could provide in individual cases advice to, to, to the different actors, as well as dispute management um, procedures that includes appeal procedures for users across borders, something that does not exist today, as well as dialogue mechanisms between um, countries and private actors in different uh, jurisdictions if there are um, situations of tensions. Um, so to start the discussion, I would, um, I would like to, to come to, to Emma. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, the current Westphalian toolkit um, that people try to, to, um, to apply on the internet and the corresponding challenges. Um, especially um, one of the major debates is the reform of the MLET system, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties, which are the conventional, traditional way of interstate legal cooperation. Why does this pose so many challenges today and, and, and um, why are people saying that it's um, not adapted to the digital realities of, of the internet? Sure. Uh, thank you and thank you so much for the opportunity um, to speak with you all today. I hope we can get everyone involved in a, a good discussion um, as we proceed with the panel. Uh, so as, as Paul mentioned, um, mutual legal assistance treaties are uh, basically agreements between governments um, for how to handle cross-border data requests for legal assistance to obtain digital evidence from providers of online services that are outside their jurisdictions. Uh, so in in a perfect world, the, the way an, an MLAT would operate is if I'm, I'm law enforcement in country A and I'm investigating um, a crime and I know that there's an online platform um, that has information that would be relevant to my investigation, but that platform's not based in my country, that platform's based in country B, um, I can go to my central government who will ask the, um, their counterparts in country B to 
pr pursue that information under the legal processes of the other country, and then sort of send that information back through that framework um, to me to, to further my investigation. Uh, and even there, in trying to describe the simplified kind of perfect working of the system, you can see that there are a number of steps that are built into MLAT um, and that uh, kind of present opportunities for, for friction or for things to slow down. So um, some of the, the major critiques and the, the challenges posed by um, the existing MLAT systems are uh, first and foremost just the sheer amount of time that it takes to process one of these requests. Um, looking at uh, the, the US government, which is um, the recipient of a great number of um, mutual legal assistance requests because, in part because of the number of online platforms that are based in the US. Uh, in, in 2013, um, a, a re review group created by President Obama to kind of review all of the United States national security and intelligence um, operations uh, concluded that the average response time for the United States um, to an MLAT request uh, was about 10 months. Um, which, uh, you know, and as an average, that means that it's at times shorter than that, but at times also much longer. Um, and so if you think of kind of the pace of a law enforcement investigation, um, if they know that they are going to have to sort of wait for a vital piece of information um, for, for nearly a year, that's not going to be viewed as, as a realistic option um, in, in most cases. And then there's also the question of scale um, that, uh, and, and the accompanying kind of demand on governments for um, resources to process these requests. Uh, again, looking at, at the United States, um, in I think currently there's about 11,000 requests um, in a backlog at the, the Department of Justice, the, the agency that handles these requests, and they got another 3,000 requests on top of that um, in 2014. And I think this is, the, the backlog has been significantly reduced in the past year um, because they were able to secure some funding um, from Congress to focus specifically on um, streamlining the MLAT process and, uh, and another budget is coming up and they've made an additional request, I think at this point of, for the next fiscal year of $32 million just to focus on streamlining um, MLAT. And so I think when we look at these, uh, kind of these features of the process, the, the, the time, the money, and the resources, um, actually CDT works uh, with the, the Global Network Initiative, which um, just a few months ago produced a report called Data Beyond Borders, um, mutual legal assistance in the internet age that I, I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. It goes through a number of different um, recommendations and ideas about how to reform processes. But a, a key feature, I think, is um, just in trying to make processes more efficient uh, by creating standardized forms and, and actually electronic um, ways of producing these requests so that you don't have to rely just on sort of transmitting these requests in diplomatic pouches to, you know, multiple different bureaucracies, uh, you know, through multiple layers of bureaucracy uh, and sort of compounding the time that it will take, um, but having a, a streamlined intake system um, and clearly identified points of contact for, you know, who, who are the right operatives within each government to, to be handling these requests, even that would be um, a measurable improvement. Um, and could you maybe tell us exactly what, um, how the MLET system works? What, what does it cover exactly? What are the requirements that you can actually invoke um, a mutual legal assistance treaty? Sure, so they um, typically cover uh, criminal investigations and access to information for um, law enforcement purposes. And there needs to be, uh, the, the agreement set up between um, countries, one, this is sort of another potential drawback of, um, of MLATs, but that they are, they're often bilateral, just between two countries, or um, sometimes there are, are regional treaties. Uh, there's one that covers the um, organization of American states or, or agreements between a country and a region like the United States and the EU. Um, so, so there will be kind of specifics laid out in the treaties of what, uh, what this covers, but a key feature is that um, you know, quite often the, the governments will only agree to exchange data if whatever the issue is, is uh, against the law in both countries. Um, and so you can, particularly around kind of questions of, of content removal, you can imagine that um, in the United States where we have very strong protections for freedom of expression under the First Amendment um, to our Constitution, uh, there, there are a great many things that are 
unlawful content in other countries that are wholly protected under uh, the United States Constitution. And so that's going to be a situation where even if the MLAT system is working perfectly, um, it still is not going to, you know, on the, the point of view of a requesting government, it won't be responsive um, because they may just, you know, hear, hear a, a rejection of their request entirely um, from the com country that they're asking for. Um, and, you know, and some of us might think that's, that's the right outcome in certain circumstances, but it, it is, when we're looking just at the system and, and how is the system responding to resolving these um, tensions or frictions between governments, that's a clear area where um, where harmonization uh, is, you know, maybe not possible in all circumstances. And this poses a big challenge and um, because, well, First of all, there's the time delay, so if there, there's anything pressing and one of the key features of the internet is the wire spread of, of information, basically, and then that also spreads globally. So there's a challenge um, of, of, of time. There's a challenge that MLETs discover a specific amount of topics um, and that they do not exist between all countries. And um, this prompts more and more governments, um, which become frustrated by those um, barriers, basically, to enforce their legitimate um, national laws online um, to go through other channels. And those channels can vary today a lot. Um, you can see that um, companies receive emails, fax messages, phone calls um, from law enforcement agencies um, in a completely unformatted form, even if they receive court orders today. Court orders are sent not in a standardized manners, so they come in all different um, variations. Um, there's no standardization of um, translation processes. Um, there, there's um, a big challenge to know on what um, national laws those requests are actually based on today. So this poses a lot of challenges. Um, one thing that Emma mentioned is, is um, that, um, and, and this needs to be stressed, that MLATs do not cover especially speech-related issues where you do not have dual incrimination. So I would like to, to come to Dunia in the absence of, of any possible harmonization on speech-related issues, and most probably there shouldn't be a global harmonization on, on, on speech-related issues, in an, such a highly interconnected environment as is the internet, or, um, or as provides the internet, um, what impact does this have on, on um, freedom of expression and on the enforcement of national speech laws online? Could you, could you um, provide us your perspective from um, the OCE countries? And I would like to ask you also to take into account um, one of the recent hot topics in this debate, which is the, viol the, the spread of um, violent hate speech online and the question of how to deal with those new challenges and through what mechanisms. Thank you for inviting me to take part, uh, but thank you even more for raising this uh, topic and uh, this subject that is becoming more and more um, present um, and more and more complicated for all of us to address. I don't have any formula um, on how to deal with these things. Of course, I would agree with you, there is no need for you know, harmonization of uh, any issues related to free speech, uh, but at the same time, um, it seems that we are forgetting about documents that we already have at our disposals. Um, and here I'm, I'm thinking about uh, UN, UN Human Rights Council, um, Council of Europe for the countries that are members, um, a case law uh, that is already building of the um, European Court of Human Rights, uh, giving actually some guidelines on, on what to do uh, in certain cases even though that cannot help uh, in many of the controversial cases that my office is uh, um, notifying uh, almost on, on a daily basis uh, coming from a different participating states. And I cannot say that um, there are different approaches in so-called old democracies and new emerging democracies. There is a struggle everywhere. Uh, but the reasons uh, for taking down certain content and how certain countries are dealing with this are different. They are different because uh, in some countries there is an established infrastructure, there is independent judiciary to deal with these issues, uh, there are institu institutions and mechanisms to, to uh, address these issues, but in most of the countries we, we have this problem and it this problem is related not only for the online world, it is related to free speech, free media, access to information, free flow of information in general. Um, 
So what to do and how to address these issue, uh, issues? <clears throat> My main worry uh, at the moment, um, as the OEC representative on freedom of the media, of course, I have to make assessments, I have to analyze in which directions countries are moving, which kind of um, uh, legislative steps uh, they are trying to take. Um, and what I see is that those steps are mainly step not in a good direction. Uh, first thing that I see and I do not like is uh, that many states are in a way taking responsibility of independent judiciary and giving it to the governments. So you have ministers responsible for uh, call, uh, calling the, the <clears throat> sorry I'm jet lag and um, I'm sort of really <laughs> You know, when I speak, I'm confusing myself, and I can only imagine how much I do confuse you. Um, so I, I <clears throat> what the, the main point is um, that the, the judicial oversight is uh, marginalized, uh, and this is not good. This, this is uh, something that can create uh, not just short-term problems, but a long-term uh, problems in relation to um, this... Um, Issues. You mentioned, uh, Paul, uh, violent speech and hate speech. Again, most of these issues are dealt um, uh, with by national laws. Of course, in democracies, national laws are based and they are following international standards. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we see uh, that inter international documents like for example, UN resolution on uh, internet freedom, that is a landmark resolution from 2012, where it was for the first time said our right offline are the same as our right uh, um, online, uh, is something that we like to quote and we like to say how wonderful it is. But I do not see that the governments are really using this resolution as something uh, at least as a recommendation not to go in certain directions that, that can undermine uh, free speech uh, and the possibility for journalists to, to access information. So instead of opening up and instead of uh, giving more possibilities and uh, um, engaging more, we are fragmenting the internet. Uh, but of course, no government will say, yes, we are engaging in these issues. But with, with their decisions, uh, with um, their sort of attempts to, to uh, block, um, to filter, um, and here nobody is saying that there are not certain contents that should be blocked. Um, I'm against filtering, uh, if it, particularly if it comes from governments, no matter which uh, issue. Uh, we cannot do this uh, issues without judicial oversight. Um, and this is the main point that I see as a mom at the moment that needs to be tackled with the, some of the countries. And here I think of France, I mean, to, to be very direct, um, um, uh, because I think it is very important that the countries that are um, democratic countries with a long tradition of free speech, they should lead by example. I work in some parts of the world that are not um, um, democratic, they are struggling for democracy, um, even talking about my part of the world where I come from. Uh, so what we need, we need good examples, we need good practice, and when it comes to good practice, we cannot talk uh, about way forward uh, if certain steps, for obvious reasons, and the reasons are to protect society, to protect people, uh, but I think that should not be done at the expense of free speech and, and freedom of the media. Thank you very much. Let me pick on, on some, some things that you um, um, just said. Um, regarding the guidelines, I think it's very interesting to, to note um, that there are two different sort of reference frames that are actually available today. One are the traditional international documents uh, with regards to the protection of human rights. Of course, those norms should also apply online and in such interactions. But there's also a new body of criteria and norms that is emerging and that needs to be documented. Um, this includes, for instance, you mentioned the European Court of Human Rights. Um, there was a decision by the European Court of Human Rights involving um, the blocking of um, Google um, Blogspot in, in Turkey that you do not block an entire platform because of one piece of content. And you have similar decisions um, made by the Turkish Supreme Court recently yes. Um, regarding the blocking of YouTube and Twitter, but also um, the High Court in Pakistan came to a similar reasoning. 
Um, so there are certain norms emerging that need to be documented in, in that regard. But this is sort of the high level or the meter level. Um, if we come down to the more procedural questions that you raised, um, there's a very tricky situation because even if um, you raise the notion of um, judicial oversight, so even if a country has the most perfect due process system um, in place nationally, um, what does this mean if, if we talk about a cross-border cross environment, if um, a platform is located in another country? Um, this is, I think, um, a, a huge question, and this is exactly what, what leads to the current tension and, and frustration in the system that we see among all the different stakeholder groups. So it's not just the governments that are frustrated um, or that struggle in a way because they, they do not know how to enforce their laws online, but it's also the companies that receive requests from potentially 196 different jurisdictions from all around the world in all different sort of formats, and they need to make a quasi-judiciary um, determination because those requests were not sent through the MLED channel and it was not um, a decision by the U.S. Department of Justice, for instance, in, in the case of U.S.-based platforms, that compels them to comply, but it's, they need to make a quasi-judiciary determination whether to um, comply or not. So this poses a, a really a new challenge um, that needs to be addressed. And... Um, Last but not least, what I found very interesting was what you, what you raised um, um, as a point, the, the, this notion of fragmentation, especially with regard to violent speech online. Um, there's a sort of feeling, there's an urgency, a need to act. So in the absence of any cross-border frameworks that are ready to use, basically, states need to and find a reply, a response in a, in a way, and adopt solutions that might look very well in the short term because they establish um, processes on the national level. But as you, as you raised um, um, the point, what happens if every country would start um, putting forth such legislation, national processes, if um, you would cumulate basically different um, national solutions, you would have a piecework and it would be much harder to, to achieve any form of standardization or interoperability at a later stage in the system. Um, I would like to, to, to come to, to Carl Frederick. Um, and um, he not only works in the, um, in the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but he's also the co-chair of... Um, the um, um, Freedom Online Coalition Working Group on the Rule of Law. And um, this resonates very well with the, the point that um, Dunja just raised. Um, what happens if, if, if you have your national rule of law, and in a way maybe it is even a national um, concept, or it's, it's actually a question, is this a national concept rule of law? Um, and even if you have an ideal rule of law system in place on the national level, um, what new challenges do you see um, if this rule of law framework is applied in cyberspace for everything that is domain seizures, um, content takedown or access to subscriber data and situations where actually the platforms or operators are located in other jurisdictions? Uh, well, thank you, Paul. I'll, I'll speak as a government expert, so I'll be able to speak a little bit more uh, freely uh, than as a representative uh, formally. Um, I'll. Um, no doubt we, we have a situation which is <coughs> rapidly rapidly unfolding, I would say, um, specifically with regards to issues such as uh, violent extremism, um, uh, terrorist content, um, and, uh, and a very, a very fast-moving and sometimes perhaps too fast-moving conversation internationally on how to deal with, with these issues. Um, clearly, um, the situation that we have now is not going to be sustainable over the long term. We heard about the problems with, with the, the MLAT system, obviously, but I would also just add that um, obviously what we're seeing now, and I, I know we talked about this before, Paul, is that we're, we're seeing in some ways a, a mesh of relationships evolving between uh, governments, uh, private actors, um, that are based on a very uh, loose, uh, sometimes even personal uh, connections and um, in, in a sense, based on um, trust. Um, so you might have a situation where uh, country X might gain uh, more access to uh, the data of service provider Y in a, another country by merely having a minister uh, visiting, for instance, or merely um, trying to establish good relationship with that or this company. 
Now that's obviously um, a very untransparent system, um, uh, but that's obviously um, the kind of parallel um, parallel uh, network of relationships that are that risks becoming even more uh, pronounced uh, over the coming years as the pressure to uh, to work on this issue increases. So um, obviously the need for practical solutions is, is there. Um, both both your work and the work of GNI is obviously incredibly uh, helpful in actually trying to move beyond just talking about these issues. Um, that being said, we always come back to the, to, to the one issue. Um, how do we deal with these issues in a way that does not really um, hollow out the fundamental principles of rule of law and, and, and freedom of speech? Uh, very concretely, um, for, for instance, from the Swedish perspective, uh, we have an incredibly strong protection for um, um, for uh, user-generated content online. Uh, there has not been a single instance, to my knowledge, where uh, even a judiciary has been able to remove content within uh, from a uh, national Swedish uh, server. Um, and the, in the, so, so the protection, um, especially under certain provisions under Swedish constitution, makes it very, very difficult for the government as such to, based on a national request, actually uh, remove content. That being said, um, as you mentioned, the transnational aspect of this is something different. Uh, were we, to, were we to, to have a Swedish uh, company with, let's say, a, a, a music company, uh, which, which of which uh, there are several distributing music to, to uh, other, other uh, countries over the internet, um, then getting a request from a country to censor one of the songs. That could be a, a viable um, situation, for instance. Uh, I'm not sure that's happened, but um, it's not impossible. Uh, the question is, what would we do? What would that uh, corporation do? Uh, as of now, it's, it's quite possible that they would simply censor it uh, based on uh, issues of market access, uh, of wanting to ensure future uh, cooperation with that uh, for particularly big markets. So obviously, it's not an ideal situation. It's very untransparent. Um, but uh, I think that one of the questions that needs to be discussed a little bit further is what should be kind of the baseline um, criteria for judging uh, in essentially grading countries, uh, grading the institutions that are making these requests, um, what should that be? Because uh, it's quite clear that, as you, as you mentioned, these requests can come from uh, numerous different um, authorities in, in, in every country, but there's also, uh, I mean, there's also a danger of making it too easy to remove content. So I, I, would, I would also like caution a little bit on that. There's a there is a um, it's, it, content removal and uh, and handing out of, of personal data is a uh, is something that sh should not be undertaken lightly. So, uh, in the process of developing new systems for this, it's important that that it's not only the efficiency gains that are in focus. Um, I would rather I would I would much uh, I would really like to stress that the importance of the transparency aspects of this, uh, which are, I think really valuable. Um, not only to be able to gauge the big picture of uh, what's really happening uh, in this space, um, uh, but also to uh, make it easier for, for companies to comply and for the general public to make, be made, made aware of, of the types of requests that are, that are coming in. Uh, I also just like just to reflect, um, this is not something that is always uh, perfectly regulated even on a national basis. Uh, even today in a Swedish newspaper, there was an article about one of our ISPs complaining that they were getting so many government requests from different government agencies mm -hmm. uh, for ISP subscriber information. Um, and obviously there you might have a situation where there is, might be legal uncertainty, I'm sure we'll look into that, or where there actually is um, a need for uh, discussing a more transparent and standardized way of perhaps even communicating internally within a, within a government or within a state, so yeah. Uh, I'll also just connect this uh, to, to the work of the working group too. I think this, this is an interesting um, discussion in terms of um, actually trying to flesh out the nice principles that we've been talking about, uh, as Dunya mentioned, uh, within the Human Rights Council particularly. Uh, we've been saying online, offline for a while now, and um, it's, I think it's really time to move beyond that and start talking about what criteria do we really talk about when we mean uh, the rule of law. What should, for instance, very um, should a Swedish company reply to a request for removal from a country that does not fulfill basic rule of law requirements for their national um, uh, judiciary, for instance? So those are important discussions and they should probably be uh, intensified. And I think it's really important to move beyond the 
uh, the normative debate and uh, consider, hopefully consider that debate uh, closed. I'm not sure it will be, but hopefully. I think one of the, um, the key points that you just raised is, is um, the connection um, to, to high-level human rights principles and um, such a transnational due process framework as it is developed by the over 80 um, entities that participate in the internet and jurisdiction process. Um, I think um, what is important, and, 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 you, and you raised this, but just to formulate it um, 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 even stronger, what is at stake is operationalizing human rights protections in a, in a way and operationalizing the rule of law, but across borders, so through due process. Um, so actually the challenge is how do we protect human rights through procedures, um, because we need to incorporate human rights protections in operational procedures, otherwise they are just norms. Um, so um, what, um, what the different participants um, in the internet and jurisdiction process are, are are striving um, for and, and what um, is, is basically reflected in, in this draft architecture is the desire to enshrine due process by design. So um, thanks to a sort of standardized um, request format that would contain around 20 different markup tags with specific fields um, including what is the specific um, national legal basis, why is this uh, necess necessary, why is it proportionate, um, by the, the formulation, basically, of, of better, more documented requests, um, this would already raise, in a way, the, the bar. And um, because, um, as, as all the participants um, mentioned so far, today requests can come in the most different forms, and there's no standardization in, in that regard. Um, and also, um, of course, transparency is one of the main guarantees because and, and it's not only transparency in terms of the statistical data, but it's also transparency in terms of what are actually the laws that apply and what are the corresponding procedures in a country if a given law is invoked. Um, so that recipients of requests um, have a better um, capacity to actually judge if a request is um, arbitrary or not, if it's complete or not. And um, that there are also procedural um, norms and criteria that allow to set a bar at a certain level. If a request does not, for instance, contain um, a legal basis, then this could be um, a criteria to reject a request until the relevant um, legal basis is attached to, the, to a given request. Um, but um, I think what would be a very interesting um, debate, and also to open up the discussion, is um, what are principles um, related to due process and transparency that we need to, to, to incorporate in procedures? What are the high-level principles that need to be incorporated in operational procedural interfaces between senders of requests? Um, so this can include law enforcement authorities, but also individuals who have a court order in their national court and so on and so forth. And um, the recipients in a situation um, where the user is actually um, in a very vulnerable sit, um, position because um, affording um, litigation redress mechanisms in, in an international environment is out of reach for, for most users. So what would you, um, and maybe we can make a tool, what would you say um, spontaneously would be core principles that need to be enshrined in an operational way through procedures? Well, I think you've um, you've touched on one of them already in looking at like a standard form of notice. Uh, this is what we've, uh, particularly in looking at requests from governments or other third parties to uh, online content hosts to internet platforms. Um, it's something that we've sort of seen time and again that if you have a platform who is hosting user-generated content and, and knows they, they might get a takedown request from any number of channels or it's not clear kind of what the criteria for them are in replying to notices, but they know that if they've received a notice, they may somehow be considered legally liable for content that they're hosting that kind of uncertainty really sets up incentives for the host to remove more content um, to, and so, and, and disincentivizes any sort of pushing back that the host might do to say, um, it's like, oh, okay, so you'd like me to remove this entire account. What about, is it, is it a specific bit of content that you're alleging as a government agent is unlawful in your country? You know, can we get specificity or particularity of um, what's being requested? So I think, if you have a system that really thinks through what are, when, you know, in a communication from a government to a company, what are the criteria that 
need to be included up front. You know, what, what law is, um, is alleged to be violated or is the basis of the request? Who is the requesting authority, an entity? Um, and you know, how, do, how do you contact them to kind of inter-engage on, on the, the notice? Um, and then specificity about the, either the user data that's being requested um, or the contents that's being removed so that the, the company in looking at it can ensure that this is as kind of narrowly scoped as possible. Yeah, and um, those are actually, exactly, those are um, um, citations almost of, of, um, of some of the um, text that such a um, request format would entail that are discussed in, in, in the process to ensure also, and, and this is something that cannot be stressed enough, um, a granularity in the in the approach of how content is removed from the internet. So is it um, a global removal because um, one piece of content infringes one national law or is it rather a national or even a regional removal if you have a federal state? Um, for how long is it forever? And um, also the prevention of any upload of similar sorts of, I don't know, tweets, um, posts, videos, whatever. Um, or is it um, very specific? Um, so this is, um, this is one of the, um, the, the um, key sets of, of um, or the, the key features to ensure due process by design. This is basically the basis in a way and also to have the contact information and not only the contact information of, of who is behind this request, but also, um, and, and this you see in the, um, in the blue boxes, um, um, the creation of um, sort of registries of, of um, different points of context so that you're sure if um, you receive uh, as a platform, for instance, a request from the law enforcement agency of Kenya that it's really the law enforcement agency of Kenya because today there are no standardized um, validation or accreditation systems in that regard and a lot of um, people from um, the environment of courts of law enforcement agencies are using um, commercial addresses at Yahoo, at Gmail, and so on and so forth. So this poses a considerable challenge with regards to very fundamental um, rule of law standards, I think. Um, Dunya. Okay. The, I mean, it's... I think you opened um, something that, I mean, definitely we cannot solve it here <laughs> today. Um, but while um, you were talking, uh, and then when you were summarizing, I mean, there are so many questions just popping up uh, um, in my head, and I'm sure that also in heads of, of uh, participants and, and all of us here. I mean, regulation is definitely not an easy task. Uh, legislating is not an easy task. But legislating and regulating uh, in cyberspace uh, on the internet is even much harder. Um, and in a way, internet freedom, the way we see it, uh, or at least people that are trying to protect rights uh, offline and online, uh, is a test for democracy. And we can establish uh, whichever tools and whichever procedures we want. Uh, but what to do if the countries are not complying with it? What to do if, um, as you said, there is a country that doesn't have a basic uh, rule of law uh, standards uh, complied with in their own country? How you deal with those uh, issues? You mentioned Turkey um, and taking down YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. That happened on several occasions, uh, several occasions in the past uh, five years. Um, and then at the end, you had um, a decision by the Constitutional Court that actually said, don't go, th the, don't go that way, uh, comply with our own Constitution. So it ruled in favor of freedom. And then again, the government called the regulator and told regulator, call the ISPs and block again YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So what to do, I mean, this is actually, you know, really, you know, taking ball uh, back to my corner because this is a challenge that I have in my uh, work uh, uh, and how to raise these issues with the governments that are coming uh, to this conference and to other conferences stating and also taking part in a discussion and saying, yes, we will support UN human rights uh, resolution online, offline. We are all the same. We will respect everything. And there is more and more 
um, of these attempts. And I'm not trying to simplify it, uh, and I'm not trying to, to be too uh, blunt uh, um, uh, and, and to shame and, and, and to blame countries, but I just, um, you know, try to talk about the cases and the issues I'm facing in my daily work. Um, and unfortunately, based on the cases and, and the real sort of issues uh, that are in a way related to human beings at the end, um, is not something um, that can be solved uh, with too much, as I said this morning, diplomatic talk, uh, because of, of um, you know, grave breaches uh, of human rights, of, of their internal legislation, but also when it comes to uh, international cooperation on the issues that are extremely important and how to really block content that should be blocked. And um, my office and many other sort of reporters working on these issues are not saying there, are, there is no, all content should be allowed. You know, there is a ultimate freedom and we should all sort of, you know, live uh, in this wonderful uh, world. No, that's not the reality. Um, but we should find a way to deal with this. And who defines which content should be taken off? Uh, you know, who defines what is violent and what is extremism, what is terrorism? <coughs> Is it just reporting about terrorism, terrorism? So it all becomes uh, really intertwined and inter interconnected. In Russia, um, in the past few years, there were uh, laws adopted uh, dealing with extremism and terrorism. Um, and if you look at the cases and the decisions taken by the regulatory authority, there are everything but extremism because of very vague uh, provisions in the law that allows for a pure censorship mm. and nothing else. There is no protection there. It's a censorship on the content that government does not like. And Russia, of course, is not alone. I think, um, thank you very much. Uh, you, you raised um, um, very, very important points. And, and um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges in the digital environment, given the penetration of the internet through all spheres of societies all around the world, is that you can today have um, very legitimate requests from countries um, with a, a not so good record in terms of, of, of their rule of law system. Um, but you can at the same time also have arbitrary requests from countries with stellar um, um, rule of law systems. So this poses um, very um, delicate um, 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 challenges and um, the documentation of, of emerging, because there, as, 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 we, as we mentioned in the beginning, there is a set of emerging norms um, that, that just needs to be documented in a more structured manner that could at least uh, help as a sort of guidance. And in this regard, we are, we are planning, um, with the help of, of Frank Larue, the former um, Special Rapporteur um, of the United Nations for Freedom of Expression, to organize in September a meeting that will gather um, the past and the former Special Rapporteurs of the different um, organizations and their counterparts um, to, to discuss how to guide this documentation of, of um, emerging norms in, in that regard. Um, Carl, um, what would you um, um, add to, 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 to this sort of tour de table of, of um, principles um, that should need to be that need to be enshrined in a operational way in the interactions between states, um, internet companies, or operators and users across jurisdictions? Well, I think I think um, Dunya mentioned a, a few of the issues that are uh, obviously the most concerning. As you as you said, we have the dual situation of um, stellar countries with uh, with bad requests and vice versa. Um, this is obviously uh, an issue to which there is no easy solution right now. I mean, we're also talking about very different types of content of requests. I mean, from from a Swedish perspective, a, a request for content removal would be a very very different thing than getting a request for um, an, um, a subscriber information for a particular service, for instance. Those are those are. They're, they're kind of they fall under different pieces of national legislation. One is a one will be a freedom of speech issue. The other one will be a privacy issue. Um, so that will they will match different national contexts. There will be other national institutions dealing with those particular two issues. Uh, so that being said, I mean w any system that um, is set up in in the future about this will have to deal with both both the issues of third party oversight um, and the privacy issue, um, the data integrity issue, because um, 
any structured collection of data on requests uh, is a valuable piece of information. Uh, it's also uh, something that we've been struggling with uh, nationally in Sweden. We've, uh, we're obviously very pro-transparency. We do substantial transparency reporting on uh, both um, uh, our national uh, or our criminal, uh, criminal intelligence uh, surveillance and our external intelligence surveillance, for instance. Uh, but when it comes to, for instance, our, our ISPs, it's been, diffi it's been difficult for them to report on issues that concern, uh, for instance, police requests, mm -hmm. because privacy legislation hits them. They're not allowed to report on personal information, even on an aggregated form. So uh, there we have a case of where actually privacy laws prevent transparency. So the issue of how to combine this system with, with like a transparency, oversight, and the protection of, um, of personal data, because what you're also dealing with is investigatory um, situations where you might, uh, you will have, a, you will have the, uh, a police requests that may be legitimate and will need to be protected for uh, operational uh, reasons. Uh, there will be a specified time period during which an investigation is taking place. I'll, I'm sure you've thought about all these things already, but um, that also needs to be combined with this issue of oversight, mm. because as, as, we, as I said, there is no, uh, th there is not going to be in the foreseeable future, I think, a blanket solution where we can say that this is country X, they have a um, system of government that is sufficiently good that we should respond to all of their requests. Um, so, in essence, the only thing that can remedy that situation is oversight and, and insight by, their, by other institutions that can at least flag up the issue if all of a sudden requests start pouring in um, from actors that should not be having it. But managing that with the privacy aspect is, is tricky. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, I um, cannot agree more that um, transparency is one of the um, most important values um, to, to also have um, public discussions on, on different trends that we see because um, the establishment of such a transnational due process that wouldn't automatically mean that the world becomes um, a better place just like that. It's a progressive um, 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 feedback loop in a way um, that needs also a public discussion about trends, about um, trends that um, come from different countries because today um, we only have um, as, a, as a source basically for our analysis um, the transparency reports of a set of, of um, pioneering internet companies that um, adopted the transparency reporting in different formats that are not standardized. So it's very, very difficult to compare actually trends across regions, especially from, from countries. Um, not to speak about agencies, um, if, if this is something that, that, is, um, that the actors um, can do in a way. Um, could I get um, um, open the, the discussion to, to um, the other people around the big table? Um, let's let's um, continue to, to collect um, um, elements of, of um, high-level principles or due process principles that need to be enshrined in procedural um, interactions. And, um, and, and also, I would be very interested to, to hear um, from you what actually would happen if we do not have would not have a system basically that would take a bit of the tension out of the international Westphalian system that struggles to cope with those internet related requests. Um, would we see a sort of renationalization of cyberspaces because um, national laws um, are based on the fundamental um, notion of separation of sovereignties? So, so does this mean that by um, applying the rule of law online, that um, we need to renationalize the internet along the boundaries of national borders. Um, what does this current situation actually mean for users' rights? Um, and what does it mean also for, for innovation, for the capacity of new companies to launch services that are globally available because they are on a website, there's user-generated content that can be liable in all the different jurisdictions. So, so let's hear some, some thoughts. Um, Maybe I just go um, to the right. Um, Bertrand, do you want to, to continue and then? Yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, to, to chime in for, for people who don't know me. I'm Bertrand La Chapelle. I'm the director of the, uh, the project that we're talking about here with, with Paul. Um, on the questions you asked before, I, I want to, to, to highlight one element that we haven't mentioned, which is a notion that users are not necessarily notified at the moment yeah. uh, of the requests that are being sent. 
Um, and the architecture that is under discussion here envisages that notification of the user uh, would be a default and allow the users to actually um, respond to the, uh, to the request and have the capacity to introduce um, this element of due process on a, uh, on a cross basis. But to, to get to the point that you were uh, raising, Carl, on um, not making things too easy, I think there is, a, there is an element which is already present in the MLAT, and let's be uh, a bit honest, as I'm not a governmental representative or so, the time it takes to handle the MLATs is of course due to um, the complexity of the issues, the lack of personnel and so on. But there is also a sort of deterrent. It is a fact that knowing that it is so long is actually a disincentive to apply. If it were responded in a couple of minutes, I mean somebody in the discussions we have with law enforcement frankly told us there was one procedure that was automated suddenly and people instead of writing and having to wait three days or four days, they could get the answer basically in 20 minutes. They began sending more and more requests, just going to get a coffee and then coming back and getting the request and it completely transformed the dynamics. So I think the answer to your question is how to not make it too easy is not by keeping um, lengthy delays, because there are useful, uh, important requests that needs to be addressed quickly, is by raising the bar of the uh, components in the request and making the due process standard higher. The notion that there should be a reference to the legal basis in the country, that there's an explicit mention of the fact that it is proportionate, that there's specificity, that is something that is not present in the current um, uh, in the current processes, and somehow is making it a bit more difficult if you do not have the right arguments to to make the proper request, including from countries that have the good uh, uh, the good the good standard. the The other point I wanted to um, to to mention is we are in an environment where today a lot of the decisions we're talking about judiciary oversight and so on as was mentioned in the previous discussion uh, today a lot of quasi judiciary decisions are being made by the private companies not that they're only wanting to do it i mean even the right to be de-indexed is something that puts the responsibility on them to make a decision between competing human rights but they are making decisions in a way that is according to the applicable laws, but nothing forces them sometimes to respect the laws in one country. So they do it according to their terms of service, more and more. And the irony is that today, although we do not think that harmonization on substance is likely or desirable among governments, the reality is that there is a certain amount of harmonization on substance that is taking place through the terms of service. Progressively, the companies, because they want to have as uniform rules as possible, have tried to integrate in their terms of service things that are picked from the different regions that they find acceptable. And we are getting to a, a, a delicate point where the terms of service, as somebody in one of our meetings said, have moved from um, being protection mechanisms. I mean, the, the expression, excuse my French, was cover your ass policies, like we're not liable, period. They have moved to become the actual de facto constitutions of the digital spaces that platforms like Facebook, Google, and others are for hundreds of millions of people. And if you look at those terms of service, and I'll finish with that, they now are beginning to, you've noticed maybe that they have structured in multiple sub-elements. Now there's a privacy part, there's a community guidelines, there are the copyright elements. They are extremely extensive. But even in the community guidelines, the point I want to raise is we're seeing them structure around basically two different blocks, things that are really specific to the platform that I give as an example, uh, a platform for cat lovers may want to exclude pictures of dogs that's really specific to the platform. That's their own community guidelines. 
But there's another part that puts all together um, hate speech, uh, violence, um, religious attacks, or um, uh, incitement to violence, and so on, that in a certain way are embedding, in terms of service, public order criteria. And today, because these are more and more used as the reference by the companies to make decisions, how to document those criteria to make sure that they strike the right balance is becoming a common problem for the governments, the platforms, and the, uh, and the, the civil society groups. And this is why in the bottom part here on process predictability, uh, the discussion is aiming at documenting what are the best practices in the companies, the best practices in court decisions around the world, and best practices in treaties, documents, as Dunia was saying, that have already been signed and are not necessarily implemented. I just wanted to throw that into the, into the mix. Um, thank you very much. May, may we continue maybe um, with the gentleman over there, the tour de table. How does this topic of, of those cross-border requests and the, the need for due process resonate um, with you? What are your thoughts? Do you have questions to, to, to the participants? I think you need to open. It's open. You need to, it's a, yeah, it's a <laughs> complex system. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think it's certainly a fascinating project that touches upon a major problem. You, and I should please? introduce myself. I forgot. Sorry. I'm Thomas Heinutz. I'm the Austrian ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. And uh, I've uh, followed a little bit from afar since I know Bertrand for a number of years. And it's great that you have now come up with uh, this uh, proposal for a solution. Uh, my question would be, uh, I've seen that at the Kickstart meeting, uh, Interpol, for example, was there, the European Commission was there, and of course, Interpol, uh, they are users. And um, to what extent uh, uh, could you maintain them involved in the uh, project as it uh, evolved? And uh, what kind of feedback uh, did you get uh, now uh, because certainly Interpol, they do not want to wait for 10 months. Thank you. As I, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, law enforcement is among the stakeholders um, that who regularly um, participate in, in the dialogue process, and I think it would be um, in a way difficult to have a discussion on those issues if it, this would not be the case. So there are law enforcement agencies from the different um, um, regions that participate, but also structures such as Interpol or Europol that um, have participated since the inception in, in the dialogue process. Um, the general reception in the law enforcement community is, is very positive. Um, first of all, by integrating them um, in the internet governance process, which is um, not sufficiently the case today because there's a lot of talk about issues that touch upon actually those things, but that do not involve them as stakeholders. In general, um, the whole system, which is a voluntary policy standard um, for the different actors, for the different stakeholders to adopt, is based on a sort of um, win-win situation for, for every actor, because this is the only reason why a voluntary standard could spread. And um, in the case of law enforcement, um, the situation is the following. They are willing to pay the price of more documented requests, of more transparency around their requests, if they at least get an acknowledgement that there is a procedure, basically, that their request is, is, is uh, taken into account and, and channeled through a formal procedure. And this already is, it provides a, a big um, value added and, and change in, ter in comparison to the current situation. Um, how our structures such as Interpol could be involved in a pilot test and, and implementation stage is uh, there are discussions, um, um, for instance, around the um, authentication of um, requesters' points of context. This is, of course, a big challenge if you have individuals with court orders because it's difficult to, to validate the authenticity of, of a given request. But um, in, the, in, the, um, in the case of law enforcement agencies, actually, it's not that difficult to establish a, um, a registry um, of who the different um, actors are, who has the authority, basically, at what level to send what sort of request, and their interpol um, could definitely play an active role in maintaining such a registry. Oh, did you mention the, the meeting in Singapore? Oh, yeah, and um, we just discussed this recently in, in, in February. Um, we had, um, there's a new cyber innovation center um, by Interpol, 
and um, we organized a, a, almost a one-day session with the leadership of, of Interpol to discuss what role Interpol could play in such a system in the validation of requesters from law enforcement agencies. Um, could I continue maybe around the table? Um, should, should we do the first? <laughs> As you want. W would you like to, to, to continue? How does this topic resonate with you and, and what are your thoughts or your questions um, <laughs> to, to the panel with regards to and the need to establish due process and transparency across borders through procedures? Um, what, 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 are, what is your takeaway um, or, or what would be your, your, your questions or the points you think are, are important in this debate, also for us as a feedback that we, um, that we can um, put forth to, to, to the participants in the dialogue process and... and <laughs> I think Professor Park case probably must have much more to say about this. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, it, it depends on how successful you um, persuade um, governments um, to accept, especially Asian governments, to accept and adopt those principles. And um, to do that, you, I think you try to involve more um, governmental organizations um, um, into the debate and into mm. into the uh, yeah into the discussion um, because we have um, in Korea we have very vi vigorous censorship regime and um, there are so many laws um, on content control uh, but like it's really uh, the Korean government doesn't consider like international level discussions and international rules. They don't actually. They don't really care. <laughs> mm. Care. So it'd be great if you, um, um, if like um, you, if um, you try to involve them um, more, act, involve them more actively to uh, into the discussion so that they can be aware about. Um, current issues and current international um, trends in these discussions. Yeah. May I, may I pick it back because I know and it resonates with something that Dunya was uh, saying earlier. Um, there is a very important question that I know you care about, uh, which is the notion of the role of the judiciary uh, mm -hmm. in here. Yes, we we yes, won't yes. solve it uh, right now. But there are different dimensions because we've been discussing and Dunia was mentioning judiciary oversight, which is slightly different from having a judiciary decision in every single case. Mm. We know that there are a lot of decisions that are being made by the platforms on their own without any requests and maybe there's a scalability problem. One thing that was triggered by the expression judiciary oversight is is a middle ground possible around the notion that it's an escalation question, that there are some things that will always be handled on a uh, non-judiciary basis because it's already what the platforms are doing for the request that you and I can make, mm -hmm. like no to this picture, yes to this picture, but that the question is how to establish appeals and what is the role of the national courts, knowing that if they are not before every single request, they can be on appeal, but why should their decision be enforceable on the company that is in another country? Mm. If you see what I mean. There, there's, a, there's a challenge here, because we don't have transnational judiciary, and it's not about creating a new one. So how to handle this question of making sure that the procedures are as ironclad as possible and where does the judiciary come into play in those things? Just oversight or in every single request? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, answering um, also the to, or replying to the points that you raised um, in terms of government organizations, um, um, from the onset we actively engaged a number of international organizations and also governments and here not only ministries of foreign affairs but also with a special off, um, effort to also get the other ministries involved in the process. Um, 
outreach to Asian countries or outreach in general is, is um, one of our main um, objectives in a way. So um, we participated, for instance, in the RightsCon Manila conference um, to, to, to get more contacts in, in, in Southeast Asia and, and, and spread the word um, and, and also invite actors, governments and, and civil society participants and companies from those regions who face those sort of challenges to participate in, 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 in this effort, in this multi-stakeholder dialogue process. Um, maybe this would be a good question um, um, to, to, to ask also the panel. Um, because she raised this notion, this challenge, how to raise awareness um, around this, um, this, this process and, and the emerging um, 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 due process framework, um, just in terms of timeline. Um, this has been presented at the, uh, in, a, in a different form at the IGF last year. Um, this has received a high level of endorsement from the different participating actors. And um, this year um, and, and, and parts of next year will be um, dedicated to really build clusters around the different elements and work out the specifications in order to have by next year a pilot version in place that can be tested by a small number of, of, of actors. Um, but how to raise awareness around this and how to, to enable um, or how to manage basically a deepening but a widening at the same time and, and reach out to, 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 to more actors. Um, what are your ideas? So I think one, one way you might go about raising awareness is to, because I think a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people's eyes glaze over when they hear transnational cross-border due process frameworks. It's sort of, you know, throw a multi-stakeholder in there and you've just put people <laughs> right to sleep. Um, but if we can look at, and this, this ties into a question you'd asked earlier about sort of what are the dangers of not finding answers here. Um, and so maybe it's to identify kind of the, the policy proposals that we see that are, you know, not the way we think sh things should go and, and then a, a framework is a good alternative. So I'm thinking of, um, you know, one, one response we've seen from governments when uh, MLAT processes are, are too slow or cumbersome is exemplified in the, the Microsoft Ireland case that's going on right now, where the um, US government uh, went to a US court to get a warrant for, um, to serve on Microsoft, a US company, for data that's stored in Ireland. Um, and they say in, in some of their briefs that, no, we're not going to use the MLAT process, it's too slow, it's not going to do what we want. Um, and it was really interesting to see actually the nation of Ireland file an amicus brief in the court, one of the main headings of which was, we will happily follow an MLAT process around this data. Um, just very clearly stating, you know, we are not part of the problem here. Um, there, is a, there is a process that could resolve all of this without, you know, this pitched battle in court over, um, you know, do, do companies have, uh, do they have to turn over data um, that they hold anywhere in the world to any com country in which they're, they're located? Um, so I think finding examples like that or um, an example, uh, something I know that's being discussed that goes right to the point Dunya was making about sort of states taking the judiciary out of these kinds of questions um, and ties in with what Bertrand was saying about uh, the terms of service becoming so uh, such a strong force among platforms. We're seeing in a lot of um, counterterrorism enforcement discussions uh, reference to states you and law enforcement officials in states using the terms of service enforcement mechanisms that companies are developing for their own platforms as a way to target extremist or radicalizing content, and sometimes even content that is not even allegedly unlawful under a state's laws. Um, and that to me is, you know, if I, if I try to think of a, a scary example that should get people to want to think about, no, what is, what's the better solution, um, that's, the, that's the sort of thing I look to, where you, you have states sort of happily, blithely pursuing mm. what seems to me like unreviewable, unaccountable censorship of lawful content. Mm. Um, so to, to kind of pull those, those really extreme examples um, uh, to try to entice people to, to think about what's the better solution. Yes, absolutely. And this is something that we label um, an evidence-based um, um, policy process. So we are trying to do this through the Internet and Jurisdiction Observatory. So through a specially designed crowd curated um, system that we developed um, or crowd ranking system that we um, developed, we um, are circulating every month a newsletter that is called Retrospect that um, features the 20 most important cases related to the tension between the cross-border nature of the internet and national jurisdictions. So there we collect um, 
also sometimes good examples, but very often those um, short-term piecemeal solutions, basically, that um, give a very good picture of the current trends um, that, that we see around the world. Um, Dunja, how would, you, how would you respond to the question of how to raise awareness, mm. how to guarantee outreach um, and inclusion? Uh, I mean, that, that's a key, of course, uh, but I think this, when it comes to this topic, we are just starting, and, and this project um, is, is a way to raise the awareness uh, among stakeholders, um, also engaging um, academia, civil society. Um, people are not aware enough about uh, the problem, about how big is this problem. Um, people are not aware uh, that in certain um, topics uh, and in certain issues uh, that we raised uh, here, we just do not have an answer yet. Uh, the same as we do not have uh, global legal norms, uh, we cannot expect to solve this with certain global um, approach. Um, recently, I was at Columbia University where similar topics were discussed. Bertrand was uh, uh, present and uh, there were many discussions. And I remember what the uh, president of Columbia University said. He said, censorship um, anywhere, censorship everywhere. So you cannot solve issues in one country. You have to, to cross borders. You have to, to find a way to, to uh, apply best possible means and tools. Raising awareness is a, is a one issue. Um, and I think this project needs to be supported. And I think these discussions need to be taken um, outside the Freedom Online Coalition. It has to go, if I may suggest, to the UN Human Rights uh, Council, to, to the OSC, to Council of Europe, and I know that you are already engaged in this, uh, but I think it has to be widened and it has to be discussed, uh, not bringing just us working for international organizations, um, but also uh, others that might be able to, 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 to help in this uh, process. Also maybe, um, you know, people that experience certain problems or people that actually are happy with the, or companies that are happy with certain takedown. Uh, um, I'm sure that there are uh, cases like that. Thank you very much. Also, oh, sorry, and I just to use the opportunity to promote something. Sorry to interrupt. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I was leaving a panel um, just two times talking to, to my colleague uh, Gunnar is that we just adopted um, um, a joint uh, declaration that we adopt every year on a certain topic uh, that is important. And when I said, um, you know, we, I mean four rapporteurs, um, David Kay, UN uh, um, uh, Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, um, Edison Lanza, uh, op uh, rep Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression of American States, Pansit Lakula, uh, Rapporteur of Free Expression of uh, African Countries, and uh, OSC representative on freedom of the media. We adopted a declaration which actually in one part talks about restrictions. And what we come up with is not revolutionary, but what we said, and it's just one paragraph. Um, and this is breaking news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it will be online in a, in a few um, minutes, but it says that declaration uh, the declaration also addresses the requirement that any restrictions on freedom of expression meet a three-part test under international human rights law, namely that it is provided for by law, it serves to protect the legitimate interest recognized under international law, and is necessary to protect that interest. So in a way it can be also applied in our discussion, not to solve the problem, but at least to give us some guidance. Thank you very much, and also for, for the very nice um, words. There was um, an intervention. Yes, please. Sorry for <coughs> coming back, but as usual, Dunja uh, gives such good answers uh, that um, it's waking my mind a little bit uh, more up with the time change. And uh, one question that I would like to uh, direct to you is, uh, of course, you, you, you work on the MLET basis, so it's bilateral bilateral treaties, uh, but... Uh, how, how do you mean um, it's, it, we... No, my question is because Dunja said global, uh, wouldn't it be a possibility to have a multilateral uh, convention 
uh, not necessarily, of course, everybody would be there. Certainly, it wouldn't be a global thing. But uh, uh, usually, you start multilateral treaty with a limited number of uh, countries and entry into force with 20 or whatever. Uh, and then it may grow when it is a success. And mm. some have grown a lot. Well, you, yeah, of course. Uh, if I may, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because it touches on the actual limits of the way we establish international norms at the, at, at the moment. Uh, the first element is, the first idea is something like a multilateral MLAT-like uh, treaty, and there's one actually that is close to this sort of definition, which is the Budapest Convention for cybercrime. But once again, to come back to what Emma was saying earlier, the big challenge is the fact that you have a good treaty when you have an agreement on what is supposed to be forbidden. And on most of the issues that we're addressing here, the problem is precisely that there's no agreement on this. So that's the first limitation. The second limitation, however, going multilateral uh, would be better than the MLAT system that I sometimes qualify as the switch network of international cooperation, like something that is not scalable, because if you want to have an MLAT treaty between all the 190 countries with each other, it simply doesn't scale. But jokes aside, the second limitation is that treaties as a tool is fundamentally intergovernmental, and here we need the engagement of a broader range of actors, both in the drafting and in the production. Uh, and the implementation. It doesn't mean that ultimately some of the norms that will emerge in the discussions will not be embedded in national uh, laws or even in treaties or in arrangements, but the approach that we see as the most uh, and that the participants see as the most uh, potentially uh, powerful is this notion of policy standard, which is something that is neither the formality of a treaty nor the complete informality of self-regulatory guidelines by businesses, nor the advocacy type of uh, civil society uh, declarations or principles, but something that combines a little bit all of them in things that go from the principles to the operational. And um, as a final point, when you look at the definition of the internet governance in the uh, WISIS, it says that it is about the production and implementation of principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs. And actually, if you look at the architecture, we're trying to address all these different layers, like very high-level principles down to very operational technical specifications. So it's a form of regime that is developed by the different actors and grows from a core group to a potential larger implementation. But going more multilateral than bilateral uh, or multi-participant than bi-participant is clearly a, a, a better approach than multiplying, I think, the uh, individual agreements. Sorry. I would like to give the last word to um, Carl Frederick. Um, again, coming back to this question of how to ensure um, raising awareness, outreach and inclusion at the same time as the deepening in a way and, and, and the transition into a pilot um, version of this framework. Well, I'll, I'll just end on a, I see we're running out of time, so I'll just end briefly on a warning note or a more cautionary, uh, perhaps a more urgent note, uh, just picking up on what Emma said about um, the fact that more governments are now using, and what Bertrand said about more government using terms of service as some kind of global constitution and against which we're judging uh, content, is that which is sometimes not even considered illegal. And this is obviously connected to the urgency with which um, the Security Council Resolution on Foreign Fighters is being implemented. and. Also, um, uh, the whole uh, ISIS problem, of course. Uh, but I w w what, but Emma, what you described as uh, so, like something that might happen sometimes is now actually the main um, is actually now uh, the main strategy of the European Union in this field. Um, so it's, I think it's, that's important to remember. Um, but that's not only because it's more convenient. Uh, for instance, for the Swedish government, it would be impossible to, um, from a government executive side. Um, even without any kind of without any kind of judicial oversight, be able to um, even in a foreign country say that content should be removed. So when these were discussions were going on in the EU, we had substantial problems with anything that would have um, made our government give, would have given our government the power to even initiate those kinds of requests. Mm. So yeah, so thanks.
Thank you, and, and um, thank you um, very much um, to, to, to our great panelists and, and also to, to the participants. And um, if you have any questions and would like to discuss, we're here and then very happy to engage. And, and also, if you want to um, invite us to give um, presentations to your constituencies, um, as we did with a lot of um, countries and international organizations already, um, please feel free. Um, we are really looking for ways to engage more actors and to reach out. Thank you very much.